Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more of our virtual conversations. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sporting a designer mask in red, white, and blue colors landed the other day at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport for meetings with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The stated purpose of the meeting was to discuss COVID-19 and intelligence sharing, but the elephant in the room was the Israeli plan to annex areas of the West Bank, a plan which has evoked a storm of controversy throughout the Middle East and also in Europe. Daniel Kurtzer is with us. Daniel Kurtzer was the United States ambassador to both Israel and Egypt. He served under Republican and Democratic administrations. He knows the lay of the land in Israel and also can help us understand the state of play. It's my pleasure to welcome Daniel Kurtzer to the program. Thank you, Jim. Now, Dan, let me ask you this. Uh, what is uh, Netanyahu doing there? He's under indictment. Uh, he's already served three terms. Uh, why is he hanging around? Well, Netanyahu truly believes that he is the only leader who can navigate uh, the course that Israel needs to follow during this period. He's been in power now for 10 years. He had also served in the 1990s. And he has a very uh, self-confident uh, view of himself and of the agenda that he pursues. On the one hand, uh, he's a conservative right-wing leader. And on the other hand, he's rather cautious, uh, does not want to get in, uh, take too many risks, get involved in uh, violent conflicts, and is hesitant with regard to almost any uh, potentially disruptive political move. And so he's hanging on. Uh, and this unity government has given him a chance to continue as prime minister, potentially for the next 18 months. So there are 120 seats in the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, and you need 61 to form a government. And in uh, this case, uh, Netanyahu's Likud party uh, did not have uh, 61 votes, so we needed to form a coalition or a power sharing arrangement with somebody. Uh, the lady in waiting was Benny Gantz, leader of the Blue and White Party, he formed this uh, coalition with Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz said he wouldn't serve with Netanyahu. He said he was opposed to annexation. Now suddenly, politics make strange be bedfellows. They're together. So what do you make of all this? Well, uh, Netanyahu certainly came out on top in his discussions with Gantz. Uh, he achieved uh, everything that he wanted. He wanted to remain prime minister. He wanted some kind of a defense mechanism against his trial that's about to begin for corruption. Uh, and he wanted support for annexation so as to pacify the right wing parties that are in the government. Gantz, uh, although had, he had opposed serving with Netanyahu, and he had opposed uh, uh, kind of roiling up the situation, decided to join largely because of the COVID-19 crisis and the need for unity in dealing with its uh, impacts. Uh, so you have a winner and a potential loser. Uh, in the immediate the period ahead, uh, the two will certainly focus on the aftermath of the COVID-19 response in Israel. Uh, they also, uh, during the uh, visit of uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, they also are now dealing uh, not only with uh, problems related to COVID, but also a challenge with related to, to, related to China, in that the Secretary brought with him a very tough message about Israel's uh, warming relations with China and how they're running across American policy. So there's a lot on the agenda. A lot of it can actually benefit from unity government, but this question of annexation is really looming in the background as a real problem. Well, as we sit here today, uh, Netanyahu is the prime minister and uh, Gantz is the defense minister, and uh, that will be the uh, state of play for 18 months as I understand it, and then uh, they will flip. Gantz will become the prime minister and Netanyahu will become the defense minister. The issue that um, interests me is, uh, because it's different from the United States, how is it that the head of government uh, can be under indictment and stand trial while he's trying to run the country? There is a law in Israel that a minister in the government cannot serve while under indictment. 
but the law does not specify that the prime minister cannot serve. Therefore, Netanyahu has maneuvered to remain prime minister so as to not fall under the purview of that law. The real question is going to come if the trial that's uh, due to begin in the next uh, week and a half uh, ends up with a, a conviction, then it's pretty clear that Netanyahu would have to leave office. But Netanyahu may still have additional maneuvers up his sleeve. There is a, something called the so-called French law, which uh, exempts sitting officials from, uh, in a sense, serving out a conviction while in office. And Netanyahu has been trying for a couple of years to uh, uh, exempt himself from the purview of the law by the adoption of this French law. I don't think Gantz will go along with it, but uh, one never knows in the mix of Israeli politics. Now, what about the judiciary and its independence? That's an issue in the United States, and it's an issue in Israel. And um, the, uh, is the power sharing agreement presently under attack in the courts? Well, there's two aspects. One is that the, uh, the power sharing agreement itself uh, constitutes a very significant attack on the independence of the judiciary. This was another issue uh, which Netanyahu won in the power sharing agreement. It provides uh, various mechanisms for uh, the appointment of judges to, to essentially be politicized and to curb the power of the Israeli Supreme Court, which has been a key demand of Netanyahu's party for many years. The belief being that the Supreme Court in Israel, unlike our Supreme Court, should not have a uh, review uh, the power of review of legislation. Israel does not have a written constitution, and this question has been uh, literally debated for the more than 70 years of Israeli statehood. Uh, so that's one aspect uh, of the situation, which is the uh, continued attack on the judiciary. And the other is going to be the way in which uh, Netanyahu maneuvers within the judicial system to avoid uh, the recriminations associated with the corruption charges against him. Is part of the power sharing agreement um, the appointment of the new state attorney general and the new attorney general? Yeah, these are these are part of the uh, the mix as well. Uh, it's not it's not entirely clear from the language in the agreement who will have the power of appointment, whether Netanyahu can make those appointments uh, during the 18 months in which he is the prime minister, whether or not uh, it, it has to go through some kind of review of the Judicial Appointments Committee, which can uh, exercise a veto and on which Netanyahu and his associates will have a majority. So you may have a situation where the appointment of the uh, state attorney and the uh, attorney general are uh, held up in uh, court challenges with regard to their basic legality. So you're seeing the politicization of the justice system, as well as the judiciary, which is an issue we have here in the United States. No, it's it's not uh, it's not unfamiliar to us. Uh, the uh, just as we we are experiencing here, uh, great concern on the part of both Republicans and Democrats that the other will dominate the judicial system and that the judicial oversight somehow takes away the power from the executive, you have the same thing in Israel, complicated by the fact that you don't have a constitutional um, power of the judiciary to review legislation. The judiciary in Israel, the Supreme Court, has exercised that uh, oversight, but uh, that's mostly been custom. It's not been concretized in law. Um, now, suppose uh, as a result of court challenges, uh, the courts throw out this power sharing agreement. Does that mean there'll be a fourth election in the course of a year? Well, the Israelis are getting very good at elections, so one can never rule that out. Uh, the court in its initial ruling basically allowed the, uh, the agreement to go forward uh, just a few days ago. Uh, it is still reviewing specific elements of the uh, agreement, and it may invalidate some of them. The question is going to be whether or not the uh, invalidation of some provisions uh, calls into question the entire agreement. I think both Netanyahu and Gantz will push back 
Um, they may have to negotiate or renegotiate those elements that the court doesn't like. But um, I would not forecast a, a new election at this point. I think there was a real possibility of one uh, before this agreement came into being, but everybody in that system right now is tired of the electoral process. And I think they just want to move forward and therefore they'll try to find a way to navigate any uh, overturning of the provisions by the Supreme Court. I think Netanyahu recently was quoted as saying that the public in Israel wants a coalition government. Well, you know, uh, having followed uh, Israeli politics and having been stationed there, both uh, in the 1980s as a political officer at the U.S. Embassy and then uh, in the 2000s as the U.S. Ambassador. Uh, I think Netanyahu's statement uh, could reflect Israeli thinking going back 40 or 50 years. The Israeli public has always wanted um, unity and they've always tried to uh, promote that unity around the center. In other words, center, center left, center right, uh, and they've eschewed the idea that uh, the political system should move too far in one direction or the other. But the way politics are structured in Israel, uh, it doesn't always lead in that direction. And you've had some unity governments in the past, but uh, normally a, a person like Netanyahu seeking to be prime minister will turn first to allies in a narrow government rather than promote a larger national unity government. Let's move on to annexation. Uh, what uh, is uh, the reasoning behind Netanyahu's apparent uh, obsession with annexation of the West Bank? Well, it's not just Netanyahu, it's uh, virtually all of the right wing, and uh, even to some extent, at least verbally, Gantz and Ashkenazi, who was the new foreign minister from the Blue and White Party. Uh, Israel has maintained control over the territories that it occupied in 1967, these past uh, 53 years. Uh, there are many in Israel who believe that Israel uh, doesn't occupy those territories, but rather uh, deserves at least uh, to own some of them, given uh, historical and religious rights. They cite the Bible. Uh, they note that these are not occupied, but rather disputed territories. All of this, of course, runs counter to virtually everybody in, in the international community. Until the election of Donald Trump, there were statements supporting annexation and there were uh, many, many legislative moves to annexation, but it just did never, it never seemed possible because of the opposition of the American administration. Trump administration has been different. It now has a so-called peace plan. I laugh when I say that because it's not really a peace plan but there is a plan on the table that would allow Israel to annex 30% of the occupied territory in return for about 14% of territory inside Israel that would be swapped back to the Palestinians when they form a state. Uh, and so for the Israelis who want to annex, this is a pregnant moment when the American administration uh, is actually in a sense goading them on saying, you've got the green light, We've given you uh, advanced support to annex uh, up to 30% of the territory. And therefore, Netanyahu says, why would I not take advantage of this, uh, given the fact that the U.S. is having an election come November? Well, the power sharing agreement expressly says that uh, the move toward annexation, doesn't say how much annexation, but it says areas of the West Bank, will begin July 1. And uh, do you believe Netanyahu is going to proceed to do that? Well, what's been interesting, uh, this, or notwithstanding the, the Trump plan, is that the administration, uh, on the one hand, seems to be holding the Israelis back just a bit. But it's a split administration. On the one hand, you've got Jared Kushner, who, when Trump announced his peace proposal, basically said to the Israelis, just slow down. Uh, let's let's uh, see what happens. Uh, even Secretary of State Pompeo, in giving Israel a green light, saying it's their decision to make, uh, also suggested, at least in background briefings, that uh, July 1st is not a holy day. In other words, the decision can take place later. On the other hand, you have uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, in Israel, a very pro-settlement, 
pro-settler ambassador named David Friedman, who has been pushing annexation for three and a half years, if not before. And uh, clearly uh, what he's saying on the ground is, you Israel have basically fulfilled all of the requirements that we have imposed. We have to do some mapping, the, you have to uh, say that you support the Trump plan, you have to be ready to negotiate, but the field is wide open, why don't you go ahead and do it? So the administration is not speaking with one voice on this question. Well, there's an issue there, isn't there? Because the power sharing agreement says that they will move forward with annexation if they have the approval of the United States government. So That's right. where does that approval lie? Uh, with Friedman, with Pompeo, or with Jared Kushner? Yeah, you know, um, pick your uh, column A or column B from the menu. Uh, Clearly, they would like to see the administration unified and get some kind of green light from President Trump. Uh, I would be surprised if Trump actually pronounces himself on this unless he sees some political benefit in it. So at, at the crunch point, some point after July 1st, there will be pressure on Washington to come up with a unified position and then to make it public. Uh, some of that will depend on how uh, Israeli coalition maneuvers, whether or not uh, Gantz and Ashkenazi, when it push comes to shove, actually want to go forward with this, or do they want to delay it a little bit? And of course, the, the big elephant in this room is not just the United States, but also in particular, the situation in Jordan. Uh, King Abdullah in Jordan has come out extremely strongly against annexation, saying it will create conflict between the Hashemite kingdom and Israel. Uh, Jordan, of course, is one of Israel's two treaty partners, and this has to give Netanyahu at least some pause, uh, given the importance of Jordan for Israel's security. Well, there are a number of factors. If Israel delays too long, it's possible um, you'll have a U.S. election and uh, Joe Biden will be the next president. If that happens, Biden's position is, supports the two-state solution and is opposed to annexation, as far as we can understand it. That's exactly right. Uh, Biden uh, made uh, his views known at a recent APAC conference, and then he repeated them in a, uh, a video teleconference. Uh, his, well, some, his, of our, some of our listeners may want to know what APAC is, so maybe you could... Uh, APAC is the ahead. American Israel Public Affairs Committee. It's the major lobbying group of the uh, uh, Jewish community, the pro-Israel Jewish community in the United States. Uh, they get 18,000 people coming to their conference. So it's, a, it's an important venue. And uh, Biden, in that venue, uh, among a lot of people who support annexation, said that he doesn't support annexation and uh, wants Israel to remain uh, firmly committed to a two-state solution. I spoke with the foreign minister of Qatar not too long ago. He said, they're for a one-state solution, but with equal rights. Now, if you have a one-state solution with equal rights, that's kind of an existential threat to Israel, isn't it? Oh, for sure. You know, they, there's an expression in the Middle East that nothing's really dead until it's dead and buried. So even if the two-state solution seems to be dead, um, you know, like in the movie The Princess Bride, it's only partly dead. And uh, it's not quite buried yet. Look, the one-state solution is, uh, is anathema to the majority of the Israeli public. Uh, and uh, I'll show a Venn diagram suggesting why this is uh, a challenge. Uh, on the one hand, Israel wants to be a democratic state. On the other hand, it wants to be a Jewish state. And on the third hand, some people in Israel would like to control all of the territories. Well, the reality is you can't do all of those three things. And if you try to control the territory, you have a critical moment of decision. Do you give full rights to all the people in the territory? which means that effectively you become a one state uh, democratic uh, uh, entity, but you're no longer a Jewish state because you're almost 50-50 uh, Jews and non-Jews. And if you don't uh, provide equal rights to the people in the territories, well then I can quote a former prime minister of the state of Israel, Ehud Barak, who said that Israel would become an apartheid state, which nobody in that country wants. So it's a dilemma which has an answer, and that is two states. What will annexation, if it occurs, and I assume it will have to be a limited annexation, what, uh, what does it accomplish for the state of Israel? 
Well, there, there are three different uh, imperatives that the uh, annexationists cite. Um, the, the most rational is the security uh, idea. Uh, by annexing, for example, the Jordan Valley, uh, Israel would uh, assure itself, um, in their view, better security from any threat coming from the East. Now, right now, Jordan is a solid ally and provides significant security for Israel, but Jordan is also a very weak country, uh, always suffering from economic problems, uh, a refuge for refugees, uh, has a majority Palestinian population, and uh, the supporters of annexation fear at some point there won't be a kingdom in Jordan, but rather a Palestinian state with irredentist ideas. <clears throat> the second view is uh, biblical historical. Why shouldn't Israel uh, maintain control and assert sovereignty over areas that were promised to the Jewish people in the Bible? Uh, and they cite the names in the Bible, Shiloh and Bethel and uh, Shechem and Hebron. Uh, all of those places are recognizable not only to Jews, but to Christians as well. And therefore, those in Israel who support this say they're ours. And the third is a practical argument. Uh, a number of very large settlement blocks are actually right next to Israel on what's called the Green Line, the line that separates Israel from the West Bank. And the view is that those places are never going anywhere anyway, so why not simply regulate their status and uh, make them a part of the state of Israel? Um, now, uh, is there uh, any way consistent with the power sharing agreement that uh, Netanyahu could uh, somehow or other uh, shut down the annexation plan? Well, sure. I mean, one of the first provisions in uh, there are two paragraphs in the agreement. Uh, one of the first provisions in one of those paragraphs says that the prime minister and the alternate prime minister, Benny Gantz, have to agree. And it could be that Gantz just puts his foot down, claiming that the U.S. is not in full agreement, that the mapping is not done, that relations with Jordan will be impacted. There's a variety of uh, potential triggers for Gantz slowing down the process. And uh, if it gets slowed down enough, if you get beyond September into October, then the question of the U.S. elections does play into Israeli politics. It would be very hard for uh, an Israeli government to take that kind of cosmic decision a month before the American elections. I thought the deal was that he had to consult Gantz, but Gantz had no veto, although Pompeo may have given Gantz back the veto because uh, it was said at the meeting he insisted that uh, Gantz be brought into the discussion and, uh, and agree to it. Yeah, and, and I think if, if you want to guarantee a, uh, another uh, constitutional challenge to this agreement, uh, it would be Netanyahu running roughshod over Gantz. Uh, you know, they have consultations. Gantz says, slow down. Netanyahu says, no. Uh, this is that would go right to the Supreme Court uh, because I think Gantz would interpret the agreement as at least giving him an, an equal say uh, based on the criteria in the agreement, um, which reflects uh, regional views, U.S. views, and so forth. Suppose they proceed with annexation. What is the international community likely to do? Do you think there'll be sanctions or punitive action against Israel, either coming from the EU or from? Uh... Um, England or from other states? Well, I think there'll be a number of very significant reactions, some of which will have an impact and some won't. Uh, there will be an effort to um, uh, criticize, condemn Israel in the Security Council. You can be sure the United States will veto that, at least during this administration. The EU has said that it will take a very strong view and there will be repercussions but the EU is not unified. Uh, just recently, 25 of the 27 members uh, signed on to a very tough statement, but two did not. And so any concerted EU action uh, may be held back by, uh, in this case, uh, Hungary and uh, Austria, who were the two parties that wouldn't join in. The Arab League uh, will certainly condemn it. And uh, that actually has potential impact uh, not so much because of the Arab League, but because uh, all the members will sign on, and uh, it could impact 
Israeli-Arab relations that have warmed over uh, recent years uh, in the intelligence and security area. And then perhaps most important, as I noted earlier, it's the impact on Jordan. Uh, I don't think uh, any uh, sane security expert in Israel can ignore the potential for an impact on Jordan's willingness to maintain its commitments under the treaty, particularly the security commitments. Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer, we've run out of time. I have one final question for you. Uh, what would you like to see happen? Well, I think the important thing is to get through the next uh, four or five months until the American election, when uh, again, hopefully, we would see an American policy that supports the two-state idea. And even if we can't get to negotiations right away, would work towards mitigating conflict and uh, resuming the effort of building uh, relations between the Israelis and Palestinians. Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer, thank you so much for coming by. This has been just wonderful. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more of our conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be safe, and all the best.